Hello and welcome back to my channel. My name is Gavin. This is my little corner of YouTube. Thanks for watching. I'm glad you're here. Today is one of those days when I am going to share with you a case that actually has some closure. And that doesn't happen too often around here because of the nature of the cases that speak to me. Today's case is actually the second one I ever looked at when I began my YouTube journey back in August of 2020. And in fact, today is the day, the day that I'm recording this is the second anniversary of me posting true crime videos to YouTube. Back when I started, I was part of Solve Crimes with Rick and Gavin, which is now called Solve Crimes TV. And not only was today's case the second case I ever looked at, it was the first case, at least to my memory, where I actually got my hands on some case documents. And when I got them, they were almost 50 years old. It's possible that it was the Carol Beth Hilburn case that holds that distinction because I got uh, those documents at about the same time, but I'm pretty sure that my memory serves correctly that it is this one, and it is the case of Nancy Banalek. Nancy Banalek was murdered sometime after 11.30 p.m. on October 25th, 1970, and before 9 o'clock in the morning of October 26th. I've had these documents, like I said, almost two years now, and I've never published them. But by the time you're watching this, you'll be ever able to go over to my website, gavinfish.com, and take a look at them if you're, if you're a supporter of mine on Patreon. By the way, let me pause here for a second and thank all of my Patreon supporters for their three and five and seven and ten dollar contributions. Not only does your money help me make these videos, but it actually gives me the encouragement and confidence to keep going. So thank you to those of you who are currently supporting me. If you would like to support me financially, follow the link below to my Patreon page. And as a bonus, you'll be able to see all of the content that I put in there, plus extra things like the Nancy Banalek documents that I'm going to talk about today. This video, today's video, is largely based on those files as well as some news reports from the time, and also a press conference that was held a little less than two weeks ago back in Sacramento. I'm gonna show you some of that press conference and it's really, uh, really remarkable what's happened in this case. Okay, let's go back to October 25th, 1970. Nancy Banalek was a court reporter working in the Sacramento County Juvenile Court. Nancy was 28 years old at the time, and she lived alone in a second-story, one-bedroom apartment off of Bell Street in Sacramento. According to investigators, and I'm not sure why this is in the official record, but they did make a note that apparently Nancy was not all that great of a housekeeper. I don't think that that's a detail that really matters. Probably what matters more is that Nancy was engaged to be married the following month. It was set for, October, or for November 28th to a man named Ferris Salome. And Salome at the time was the county's chief assistant public defender. He went on to become Sacramento County's uh, public defender. He became the president for a while of the Public Offenders Association. He was a, a public servant in Sacramento pretty much till the day of his death. In fact, one of the things I found out about Salome is that he held the record for most blood donated. He gave blood whenever it was legally allowed. Um, just a little tidbit about him. But Nancy and Salome were engaged and I think that goes to maybe show that she was an officer of the court. He was an officer of the court. So when something really bad happened to her, Sacramento took it very seriously. And before I go too much further, I think I should talk a little bit about Sacramento in the 1970s and maybe more broadly, uh, California. California in the 1970s was 
a pretty scary place to be for a lot of people, especially young, attractive women, because it was a magnet for serial killers and serial other things doers. Let's just leave it at that. I mean, there was Richard Ramirez, there was Angelo Buono, Joseph D'Angelo, Juan Corona, William Bonin, Joseph Breslin, Ed Kemper, Roger Kibbe, and a slew of others, many whose names we still don't know, like the Zodiac Killer. So all of these terrible crimes are being committed by crazy psycho killers all over the state, and Sacramento had its fair share of these crimes. Personally, looking back, I think the completion of the internet interstate system and the renaissance of fairly inexpensive air travel had a lot to do with it. Um, people could get in and out of areas quickly, and as long as they didn't leave behind their fingerprints or as long as they didn't allow a witness to see them, they were pretty much in the clear. And while there were fewer laws that in practicality could protect a killer's privacy, there just wasn't all that much in terms of technology that could help police prove that a person committed a crime. So if you wanted to commit some sort of heinous crime, you'd choose a city like Sacramento. You'd choose to do it at night when fewer people could see you. And you do it in places that were near a freeway or some other location where you could get away pretty quickly. Nancy Benelik's apartment building was situated along, pretty close, let's say, to California Business Highway 80. And just to maybe expand this illustration just a little bit more, Joseph D'Angelo, the, the Golden State Killer is what we call him now, he used the greenways along the American River to get away easily when he was doing his thing, which was a little bit, a few years after the time that uh, Nancy's murder occurred. Okay. In October of 1970 in Sacramento, the entire city was still reeling from the abduction and killing of a woman named Judith Ann Hawkery. You can go back to Solve Crimes with Rick and Gavin, the, the YouTube channel I used to be part of, and you can see everything we did on Judy's case. But basically, Judy had been taken in the parking lot of her apartment building, and her remains had been found almost two months later up in Weimar, California, in the Sierra Nevada mountains. And her case was ever present in the papers. Um, and Judy's Judy's apartment was very close to Nancy's. If you were to walk between the two complexes, it would only take you a minute or two to get from one to the other. And if you were to stand on the balcony of Nancy's apartment, you could see Judy's. Um, I, and I guess I'm telling you this so that you understand that everybody was on high alert at the time. And it was going to get worse before it got better. And also keep in mind Sacramento's proximity to the Bay Area and the North Bay, which was where all of the Zodiac Killer stuff was taking place. So it, like I said, everybody was on high alert. Okay. October 25th of 1970 was a Sunday and Nancy Benalek and her fiance, Farah Salami, spent the day together. First, they went up to Grass Valley, California to visit her family. Grass Valley is a, it's a city um, located in the western foothills of the Sierra Nevadas, about an hour outside of Sacramento, along historic Highway 49. It's in the northern part of what locals would consider gold country. I mean, it's picturesque. There are lots of rivers and streams, lots of old mines, things like that. It's, it's beautiful, I have to say. And in the 1970s, there were only about 5,000 people living there. And even if Nancy didn't have family there, it would have been a good place to go for the day. Lots to do, lots to see. So 
Nancy and Ferris spend most of the day up there in Grass Valley, and then they returned to Sacramento and went back to Nancy's apartment on Bell Street. Then they went out for dinner and then back to the apartment where they spent some time alone as soon-to-be married couples do. At about 11.30 p.m., Ferris told investigators that he left the apartment. And I should restate that. Ferris told investigators that he left the apartment at about 11.30 p.m. That, that's the better way to say that sentence. When he left, he said Nancy was asleep in her bed, that the sliding glass window or the sliding glass door in her bedroom was left slightly open so Nancy's cat could get in and out. Behind Nancy's apartment building, there was a narrow passageway of lawn, and then there was a fence. And that strip of lawn was maybe five, no, maybe eight to 10 feet wide. In fact, her cat likely used the exact same method of entry and escape from the balcony to the fence to the ground as her killer. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Sometime at about 2.30 in the morning, that would be October 26th, 1970, neighbors said they heard a scream. They described it sounding like a child was screaming. And apparently, this didn't arouse any suspicions. Not enough to get up and, and investigate it anyway. So neighbors just went back to what they were doing. Most of them were probably asleep. The following morning, Monday morning, Nancy was expected at work at the juvenile court at 9 o'clock, the same as every other weekday. And she was known to be punctual and reliable. She usually was a bit early for work, in fact. So when she wasn't there within a few minutes after 9, her co-workers began to get worried. This just wasn't like Nancy. And without the technology that we have today, they couldn't text her, they couldn't call her cell phone. So uh, they decided to just, uh, you know, check in on her. And the reports don't say specifically how, uh, but I'm sure that a call was made to Nancy's apartment first. It, it doesn't seem to me like somebody would call Nancy's sister first. So I'm guessing that the call to Nancy's sister was the second call that they made. And Nancy's sister is a woman named Linda Cox. The report says they called her work and Linda didn't know anything, but was also concerned. So she called a man described as her friend and neighbor, Jack Moncrief. Mr. Moncrief was the son of Nancy's co-worker, Joella Moncrief. And you don't have to remember that there won't be a quiz, but I guess I'm putting it in here to show you that Nancy was part of a tight knit group of co-workers friends, and family. Mr. Moncrief, after getting the call that something might be wrong with Nancy, made his way over to the apartment and knocked on the door. No answer. He knocked again and nothing. So he called out her name and didn't get a response. This didn't sit right with Jack Moncrief, so he went to the apartment's manager's office and told the manager what was going on, a person named Lyndon Anderson. And again, there won't be a quiz, but Jack told Lyndon what was going on. The two walked back over to the apartment and Anderson let Moncrief in. At this point, Anderson leaves and Moncrief goes in and finds Nancy dead on the floor of her bedroom. At that point, he comes out of the apartment, catches up to Anderson, and tells him to call the sheriff's department, which he does. The first responders to the scene were members of the Arden Fire Department, which wasn't very far away. The fire chief went inside and checked on Nancy. He quickly discovered she was deceased, so he left the apartment and awaited the sheriff's officers. And at this point, 
I think the best thing to do is to read the description of the scene from the coroner's record. Quote, The subject was observed in a bedroom at the south side of the apartment. This is a one-bedroom apartment. The subject was lying face down on the floor of the bedroom. She was at the northwest corner of the bed. She was lying with her head to the southwest on the left side of the bed. She was between the bed and the north wall of the bedroom. Her face was buried in a pillow taken from the bed and at the northwest corner of the bed. The pillow had been cut and portions of the stuffing were coming out of the cut places on the pillow. The subject was clad only in a white pair of panties. Clothing was lying at her feet and partially under her feet. This consisted of a blue and white striped blouse, blue denim cut-off jeans, a blue sweater with red and white trim, and dark blue shoes. One shoe was between her feet and the other right shoe next to the right knee. A green print blouse and a pair of white socks were near the northeast corner of the bed. About 12 inches to the north of the subject's right elbow was noted what at first appeared to be a bloody band-aid, but which later proved to be a piece of masking tape with blood on it. That, apparently, had been around someone's finger. There was a similar piece of tape located on the patio balcony at the south of the subject's bedroom that is reached by going out a sliding glass door. The bed was disarranged with the sheet, a white and a pink blanket, and a white bedspread, had been pulled to the southwest corner of the bed. The patio door was open about 18 inches with the drapes pulled shut over the opening. This subject was lying with her arms flexed at the elbows with both hands at shoulder level and with both hands out of sight under her chest. The right hand later proved to be in a normal outstretched position, but the left was partially clasped with only the index finger outstretched pointing toward the base of the throat. There was a large pool of blood under the subject's head and upper body that had apparently expanded to under the northwest corner of the bed. It apparently had soaked the carpet and padding under the carpet. There were three spattered type areas of blood on the bedroom door nearby. Blood was also on the drapes of the patio door leading to the outside. There were noted blood spots on the east end of the balcony patio. One drop of blood was noted on a shelf inside a homemade type desk shelf combination. The patio balcony has no exterior exit and is approximately 15 feet from the ground. This has a wall around it approximately four feet high. It has four apparently bloody marks in the form of a partial handprint. It appeared as if someone had attacked the subject and then vaulted off of the balcony to the ground below. Scuffed marks were observed on the ground under the balcony as if the assailant landed there. That's where I'm going to stop because it gets gruesome from there and there's no need for that. We don't need to get really bad here. So what have we learned so far? Number one, we know that the front door was locked, so the point of entry was likely the balcony. The balcony door was left open. Number two, Nancy was in a state of almost complete undress. I'm not sure if that's how she went to bed or maybe that happened during the struggle that she had with her assailant. Number three, there were bloody pieces of masking tape that had been taped around someone's fingers. One was found inside, near her right elbow, and another was found on the balcony. Four, they had a trail of blood, and 
That's where I want to take it over to the press conference that was held earlier this month to talk about more of the details from the scene. If you followed the capture of Joseph D'Angelo, the Golden State Killer, then you'll probably recognize Mickey Lynx, who works as a volunteer on the Sacramento County Sheriff's cold case team. Sometime between the hours of 11.30 and uh, on October 25th and the early morning hours of October 26th, the suspect gained entry into the victim's apartment by climbing up to the, store, the second story um, balcony and going in through the slider. The suspect stabbed the victim over 30 times and nearly decapitated her during this murder. The victim sustained numerous defensive wounds on her hands and arms, indicating that she fought with the suspect. When in investigators arrived and began processing the crime scene, they located a blood trail, which began at the top of the balcony, down to the sidewalk below, followed along the sidewalk around two of the apartment buildings and ended at the um, parking lot. The investigators determined at that time that the suspect must have got into the vehicle and left the scene. So when I started YouTubing in August of 2020, almost 50 years after Nancy Benalik was viciously attacked and killed in her apartment, after spending a relaxing and enjoyable day with her fiance, that's where the case stood. When I found out about this case, I reached out to Mickey Lynx to see if she had any comment about where everything stood. Her name was listed on the Sacramento Sheriff's cold case page as the lead detective. She briefly, but kindly, told me that she was aware of the case and was working on it with a team of investigators. She said in the press conference she'd been working on the case since 2005. So I think I should stop and say this. When Mickey replied to my email, I actually was a little upset that she didn't seem to be taking things seriously. Of course, those of you who know my journey into true crime know that I wasn't experienced at all in dealing with law enforcement, nor did I understand the processes they go through. And while some might come to the conclusion by watching my videos that I don't have a lot of faith in the police, that conclusion is 100% wrong. I have faith in investigators like Mickey Lynx. It's corrupt cops and inept cops like the ones that investigated the Amanda Winkowski case or Rochelle Brinson or Ellen Greenberg. Those are totally different. Most cops are terrific. But I was frustrated with Mickey that she didn't give me any information or comment on Nancy's case in the short back and forth emails that we had together. And I've learned since then that the state of California prohibits anything like what I was asking for. So having Having said that, I'm still in the position that there should be an expiration date on withholding investigative files from the public, and this case is the perfect example of that. It ended up being solved by genetic genealogy, and I'm going to show you that part of the press conference where Mickey talks about that. So releasing the investigation files to the public would not have hurt the ultimate outcome of the case and may have even helped. And I know many people in law enforcement disagree with me, and we're just going to have to agree to disagree. But I wanted to bring that up so that you guys know about my interaction with uh, Mickey Lynx two years ago. Okay, let's get back to the press conference. The case was investigated very thoroughly at the time of the crime and throughout the many years to follow, as, detect as Under Sheriff Barnes just talked about but no suspect was ever identified. In 2004, a forensic DNA profile was developed from the blood drops at the scene. The unknown male profile was uploaded to both the state and national CODIS databases. However, there was no match ever to an offender. In November of 2019, investigators from the Sacramento County Sheriff's full case team 
and investigators from the district attorney's office, began our forensic genetic genealogy investigation. Let me talk a little bit about CODIS and the difference between it and genetic genealogy. And by the way, I have a whole video on this subject that you can check out on my channel. I'll link to it below. CODIS stands for Combined DNA Index System. It's a database of DNA information from convicted offenders, from missing persons, and from crime scene evidence. CODIS uses a type of DNA profiling called short tandem repeat analysis. Think of DNA as a language with an alphabet of only four letters, A, C, G, and T. And the language or code of a person's DNA is then written out in a string of a combination of those letters that's about 3 billion characters long. In short tandem repeat analysis, they look for places in that code where a letter repeats, A, 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 C, 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 and, and so forth. Basically, what they do is they take a look at the code from a sample they have, then they go to very specific places in that code, which they call loci, which is just the plural of locus, which is a place. And at each locus, they look for repeated letters and they count how many times the letter repeats. They do that, they do that for 20 loci. It used to be 13, now it's 20. And once they have the number of repeated letters for each locus, they then have a statistical certainty that if they find another sample that matches, then the samples come, came from the same person. What's great about CODIS is that it's a standardized way to test DNA. And every law enforcement agency in the US and most of the world uses this system. The downside of, of CODIS though, is that you have to have a direct, per, well, person to person, it's a direct sample to sample match. So if there isn't a sample in the CODIS database from the same person that you have a sample of their DNA, you're out of luck. Genetic genealogy is different. It looks for something completely different in the DNA called single nucleotide polymorphisms or SNPs. And then that is pronounced SNPs. They're the, um, they're the most common types of genetic variations among people. The entire human family shares 99.9% .9 of the same genetic code. Doesn't matter what your race is, what your color is, where your family comes from, we're all 99.9% .9 the exact same. It's in the 0.1% that we have differences. And those very generally, I'm not, I'm not speaking, I'm not teaching a class here, nor am I qualified to, but those are very generally called mutations. With SNPs, law enforcement can look at your DNA code and then look for others who have the same or similar mutations. And assuming they have a very large set of data, then they're able to use those findings to track down ancestors, siblings, children, or even you directly. And even if they can't find you directly, they can triangulate you by finding one, two, three, four of your relatives and where their, say, genetic circles intersect, that's you. Of course, there's a huge debate about the ethics of all of this because the data that law enforcement uses mostly comes from people doing 23andMe kinds of genetic testing and then uploading their DNA profile to a system called GEDmatch. GEDmatch is the database that police are mostly using when they talk about genetic genealogy. One other thing I wanna say about this is that it's not just all automatic. It's 
labor and time intensive by people who spend their lives honing this craft. Now, I love family history research, and I would say that I am a decent amateur genealogist, genealogist, but genetic genealogy is a different animal completely. So when Mickey said that they began their genetic genealogy work in November of 2019, and they announced they found their guy in 2022, that's an indication of how much work it takes. Not that they were somehow being lazy or resting on their laurels. On July 21st, we identified the suspect as Richard John Davis, born March 22nd, 1943. Unfortunately, Davis died in Sacramento County on November 2nd, 1997. At the time of his murder, we determined that Mr. Davis was actually living in the same apartment complex as the victim. Due to the fact that Richard Davis is deceased, sadly there won't be any form of legal justice. But Linda and Tom, I hope this brings you, Nancy, and your family some peace. I want to thank the many de dedicated de investigators who throughout the past 52 years did a tremendous amount of work on this case. Lastly, there are several amazing selfless people who were instrumental in save helping us solve this case. I won't mention their names. You know who you are, and we are eternally grateful for your help. So that's the guy who did it, Richard John Davis. At the time of Nancy's murder, he would have been 27 years old, basically Nancy's age. And this guy lived the rest of his life 27 more years after getting away with murder. And he did it by putting masking tape over his fingers. And it makes you wonder how the rest of his life went for him. Was this the only time he ever did something like this? Did he feel guilty or, or did he feel any kind of remorse? And do you know of any motive possibly for this? Well, unfortunately, with him being deceased and not here to tell us, we don't. But, um, you know, the fact that we discovered that he lived uh, right uh, across the pool from her apartment, uh, so he had sight of her apartment, um, we're just going to surmise that maybe he had some attraction to her or something. Uh, but again, that's just, just a guess. Um, but clearly... Uh, he intended to do what he did that day. Um, this man put uh, masking tape over every one of his fingers. I guess gloves weren't that easy to find those days uh, to conceal his fingerprints. So, you know, were he alive, I think we're talking a premeditated murder, right? But, um, you know, we just, we don't know. I have had a question. Um, at the time, there was uh, the blood trail indicated in investigators that that the suspect might have suffered a wound during the struggle with the victim. Um, among those 500 people that were interviewed uh, soon after the death, was he among them, the suspect? Well, he actually was interviewed by investigators. Um, normally, when we have a, a crime, you do a canvas of the area, especially an apartment complex. Uh, he was interviewed uh, with his uh, roommate. Um, I've actually spoken to his roommate recently. Um, but he, uh, they kind of alibied each other, um, so we don't know. I think his roommate, maybe he snuck out after they supposedly went to bed. He was interviewed. Uh, I don't believe they saw, obviously, a, a wound. Um, the original investigators actually went to every ER in Sacramento County and um, got the names of people that had uh, been cut, you know, on their hands or arms. Uh, of course, with HIPAA these days, you're not allowed to do that. But back then, they were able to get that uh, list, and they actually talked with every one of those people and were able to alibi all of them. I'm still not quite curious. Was it DNA that, that matched, and, and how was that? How were the two matched? So the, the blood the blood trail 
we surmised was our suspect, right? He cut himself after leaving. Um, he cut this woman, the victim, over 30 times, so he obviously cut himself. That blood was tested at the time, and we got a blood type, um, but that didn't tell us anything. Then that sample gets uploaded to CODIS, which is compared to all the convicted offenders, not just in the state CODIS, but the national database, and there was no match. What we used this time in 2019 was genetic genealogy, which is a different type of DNA, and basically you find people that are relatives and you try to narrow down who this person is. And uh, just, I'm sure this might be a question, but we have confirmed that he is our suspect. Um, we have a, a, a relative that was gracious enough to um, provide their DNA and uh, we were able to confirm that he is our suspect. So that, my friends, is the story of the murder of Nancy Benalik and the almost 52-year chase to find her killer. I can't say it's a happy ending, but it is an ending. And that's more than a lot of victims get. I hope that Nancy's sister Linda and her family do end up getting some peace and finally having answers to the questions they've had for over five decades. I often come back around when I'm thinking about cases like this to the question that I've been asking myself for two years now, pretty much since I started getting into true crime. And that question is, why do we care so much that we'll spend what seems like unlimited resources on finding justice for people who were taken from their friends and family in such tragic, violent ways. Why do we do that when we know our efforts will always, always fall short of actual, real justice? We know that there's no restitution that's big enough. We know that there are no punitive damages that will make up for what was lost, and yet we do it. I think it's because we each hope that somebody would do it for us if we or somebody we love were the victim of a similar crime. And so I'm happy that we do it. With that, I bid you adieu, and I hope to see you next time. Take care. Any other questions for me? And he was living at the same apartment at the time, at the time of his death? The complex, yes. She was in 17, he was in 23. Mm -hmm. Once again, when, when did he die? He died, uh, I think it was November of 97? November 2nd. Yes. November 2nd, 97, yeah. What was the cause of his death? I don't remember. Do you guys remember what I think? Alcoholism. Yeah, I think I think it was related to alcoholism at some point. Yeah. So. Fair to say that you had to wait for technology to catch up in some ways for this. And that, as uh, D. A. Schubert just said, is is you know where we are, um, but. You know, that, that's the whole thing of this, is not forgetting these cases. I mean, we have so many. I'm so happy to do this so that the families get some answers, but we have a lot more to do. Um, but yes, the technology improves every time, and every time it does, we solve more cases. So um, we're just waiting for the next good tool that comes about, so yeah. How long did he continue to live in that apartment house? That we don't know. Uh, his roommate couldn't remember when they moved out of there. Um, he was in Sacramento for uh, at least till 74, 75, and then he moved out of state and then returned uh, sometime in the mid 70s, mid to late 70s before he died. So he had the same roommate at, when he moved away from that apartment? No, no. Oh, no. You just question them. The, the roommate just couldn't remember when they moved out of the Bell Street apartment. Did the roommate have any kind of 
Or yeah, no, he, he didn't. He said, I don't think I'd look into this guy. I don't think he had, would have done anything this bad. Thank you very much for watching this video. If you liked what you saw, please subscribe to my channel. And if you have any comments or questions, please leave them below.